And you said, you know, we're getting so far away from how we're intended to eat. And I, I cannot stop thinking about those as examples. Like we're so focused on the environmental components of what maybe a cow house at a pasture, which we don't even, you know, we've already talked about we don't even have the correct understanding of that. Right. So that's built off of falsity. Um, but we're so focused on fixing that, like lowering our methane reductions, let's say that we're willing to instead eat this 3d lab printed meat. Like what's that doing to our body, you know? And I just, it blows my mind that that's the point we're at in society where we're willing to make those decisions and sacrifices. Um, and a lot of them are based off not even true facts. You know, it's like we're, it's so turned up right now. It's turned upside down. Hey, everybody. Welcome back. You're listening to the Ancient Health Podcast. My name is Courtney, and I have two fabulous ladies. These are some real cowgirls. They are ranchers. So you know what? Put your put your boots on and get ready for the real deal because these ladies are out just blazing a trail when it comes to awareness in the agriculture space, and I can't wait for them to share. So we have Natalie Kovarik and uh, Tara Vanderdusen, and we are so excited to have you ladies. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah, thanks for having us on. We're excited to talk with you and your audience today. Yes. Sounds like things are going to get a little Western. I'm all about it. I, I should have worn like a cowboy hat or, you know, something, but maybe, <laughs> maybe I'll be more inspired after this to do like fully committed right now. I just keep picking up all the little things. So if you're following along my personal journey in life right now, this is where I'm trying to get to is where they're at. <laughs> so one is in Nebraska, one's in New Mexico. Both of these ladies are, they kind of have their own wheelhouse, right? So Natalie, you're more on the beef side and, and then, uh, for dairy, right. For dairy yep. cows. Um, uh, so we have Tara that, that does all of that in that space. So it's kind of cool how you guys came together. I'm actually really curious. How did you guys meet? You're not geographically located near each other. So how, okay. I, we need to maybe start. That's a great starting point. Cause I would love to know how the two of you met and came together really to sync up on this mission. Well, we met how most millennials now meet their friends, right? Online <laughs> through Instagram. Uh, we started connecting via DMs, gosh, probably like five or six years ago. I don't know, a really long time ago, it feels like. And um, we just started, you know, back then there wasn't a ton of women in ag sharing online about like kind of their farm and ranch stories. So we had kind of a group that connected and would kind of share and encourage each other. And um, I feel like our conversation moved from online to offline and then meeting up in person uh, and then growing our businesses together and kind of like the rest is history, I guess, from there. That is so cool. I always love finding, it's really cool now that social media, that's probably one of the, the real silver linings of social media is that it brings so many people together that otherwise would never have crossed paths. And you guys have now built a business together. You have a very wildly successful podcast together. So what is it that you really want? I guess what's, what's your message to people that you're really wanting to bring awareness to when it comes to agriculture specifically? Yeah. So we teamed up for our podcast, Discover Ag last year. And I think it was really birthed out of one, our passion for what we do. So our lifestyle, you know, uh, personally on our operations, and then, you know, at a, a macro level, whole, the whole industry, we're very passionate about agriculture across the nation and global. Um, but we really also, I think, felt that there was a lot going on in the media space, in articles, social media, you know, online everywhere that was talking about food and agriculture, but it was really coming from non and food, non um, ag and food sources. And I think we just recognized that it would be really neat if there was a place that people were interested in, you know, what was going on with the food industry and what's going on with, you know, farmers and ranchers. And instead of hearing it from someone that was writing an opinion piece for the New York Times that lived in Upper West Side, they got it from, you know, a person that lives in Nebraska that's actually on a cattle ranch and a person that lives in, you know, New Mexico that's actually on a dairy farm. And so, we really like recognize that niche about, you know, providing value about the industry from the industry itself. And then we try and do it in a fun, sexy, cool way. You know, we're two millennials. I think we have a different perspective than people would think of when it comes to agriculture. And so it's been really fun to, you know, not only talk about ag um, in general, but uh, to do it in our, you know, Natalie and Tara way, I guess. Yeah, it's really interesting. I love how you both show this through Instagram specifically, but um, Tara, I know that you have kind of 
gone toe to toe or kind of debunked a little bit, a lot of the stuff that's trending, uh, because we'll see a lot of people jump on a bandwagon where they'll say no dairy whatsoever, you know, conventional farms, or, you know, even if it's not conventional, it's like all bad. It's all lumped into this idea that, you know, farming of, of milk is not for humans. Like we shouldn't be consuming dairy in any way. And so there's all of this stuff that goes viral and it gets reposted everywhere. So what do you, what would you have to say about some of that? And I know some of the stuff that you've posted has been really helpful, but maybe just to bring clarity to it, because I think this is a place, this is what's really interesting is we learn so much just through most, I mean, most people are gathering their information from the people that they follow. And these are like you know, maybe not people that are, like you said, out actually doing the work, you know, it's just that they're picking up pieces and then they compile it together in a really sexy way. And all of a sudden it's like, yeah, that's what I identify. That's what I relate to. So yeah, I would love for you to just speak into that a little bit. Yeah. So that was kind of how I, exactly how I started sharing online was I was a new mom and I joined a lot of mom Facebook groups, a lot of just like social media groups. And, you know, with new moms, like a lot of the conversation is around milk, right? Like, do you transition your kids to cow's milk at a year old? Like what, you know, all the things about food choices or introducing foods to kids at a young age. And I was seeing so much misinformation. I got my degree actually in environmental science. So I was um, practicing as an environmental consultant for dairies throughout New Mexico. And a lot of times, even the conversation would turn to, you know, sustainability, what what was dairy's impact on the environment, all of those conversations in addition to the nutrition. And I was just like, this is not what's happening. Like this does not line up with what is currently going on on dairy farms and what, you know, registered dietitians are saying about like health benefits of animal protein. Uh, And so that was where kind of like the birth of sharing online started was just wanting to be able to have these conversations and open up these dialogues and maybe give a different perspective that people weren't seeing. And it is so hard. You know, we have, if you have a video go viral, that is something, you know, anti-dairy, anti-animal ag, it can really influence people's decision-making from then on. And it'll be a nine second clip that that's it. That's what they take as, you know, the truth. And so being able to kind of like go back in and have a platform to be able to share, especially Natalie and I both on the podcast, like to get into more nuanced conversations. Like things are not black and white. They're not always as simple as people want them to be. And being able to get into those complexities of those conversations, um, I think, and I hope, really broadens people's horizon around what ag really looks like, what dairy farming really looks like, what cattle ranching really looks like, um, and just just gives people a place to go to have those conversations. Yeah, that's great. Now, are you both of you on like the working side of the ranch? Like what does your typical day-to-day look like? Maybe Natalie, you could start with that. I'm I'm so curious to know because you're running businesses. Like I'm just picturing, you know, maybe you have families and you got kids, you've got there's so many different responsibilities. And so you're you're it's it's like you live in two different eras. Like you live in like the, you know, the wild west and then you're, you know, syncing up for a podcast and doing stuff. I'm like, what does this day-to-day look like? It is a medley of things, Courtney. It is quite the variety. So up until about two years ago, I actually uh, worked off the ranch. Um, I got my education in pharmacy. And so I was working as a pharmacist. We had, we have a small critical access hospital where we live. I'm from very rural Nebraska. It's about a town of 2000. And, um, but we did have the critical access hospital. And so I worked off the ranch doing that. And then kind of at the same time, I was building what, you know, I have individually online as well as what Tara and I do together. And I came to this almost climactic point where um, I couldn't show up um, at my job off the ranch. I couldn't show up online. I couldn't show up as a wife and a mother and for our operation altogether. And so I I made that decision to step away. So now I am, to answer your question, um, fully on the ranch. Um, I am not like, quote unquote, an employee. So I don't have like designated jobs where if I am not out doing it that day, it does not get done, um, mostly because I have little. So I have three boys. Um, One is in school and two are not. Um, and so the littles are with me. Um, so weather dependent, mood dependent, we're usually out with my husband doing chores um, all day long. I, I love to wake up and be outside. I love to have my children wake up and be outside. Um, but I don't have per se, like a exact responsibility on the operation. Okay. Okay. What about you, Tara? 
Yeah. So I guess kind of similar as Natalie kicked it off, like it's all over the place. Um, up until two years ago, I was working full time as an environmental consultant. So what was kind of cool about that is I actually worked on a number of different dairies beyond our own. Like our dairy was one of my clients and I got to work with them as well as lots of other dairy farmers, um, which I really enjoyed. I loved going and seeing other dairy farms and working with them on sustainability projects and water conservation projects. And then two years ago, I took a step back to be able to be more involved in what Natalie and I do have more time, family balance with my kids, and then be a little bit more a part of what my husband does and be more part of our farm. Um, I've kind of found that my role on the dairy is actually not traditionally on the day to day. Um, I got part of my degree was in policy and law, and I have found a real love for being involved in that side of things. So I actually just got back like two weeks ago from Rome and was at the UN working with the food and agriculture organization on a gender equality in agri-food systems. Um, and that has just become like a very big passion of mine is being um, a part of those conversations, making sure that farmers have a seat at the table. It's not always easy for farmers and ranchers to leave their operations to go and like actually have a voice in different places around the world. And um, I am just so honored and privileged that I have that ability to go do that. Um, and so that's kind of where I found um, my role. It's a very unconventional role, maybe, but it really it inspires me and drives me. And, um, you know, I just feel like that's where I best serve our industry. Yeah, it sounds like it's it's really cool that you can step in and kind of be the voice because you've seen and been able to put your hands on like the very tactile part of the ranching. And now you're able to actually take that where you said, like most farmers are not going and probably ha one have the time or the energy to advocate for what it is that they're doing and protecting their business and the integrity of it. So that's, that is incredible of you to be able to step in and do that. You said something too, about being in the environmental space before, which this is so fascinating to me because one of the biggest things that you'll see or hear a lot of times about you know, cattle specifically is that there is some influence of uh, negative influence on global warming and climate change and all of these different things on the environment, even just from topography and the land usage and things like that, that the cattle are just destroying it. Like we're destroying our soil, we're destroying, destroying our land and the air and everything else. So I would love to even touch on that because there's obviously been a big movement in the plant uh, forward sphere. And, you know, we love plants, but, you know, I just recorded a podcast on protein and how important it is for women's hormones, specifically coming from animal products. And I'm a huge advocate of that. So I'd love for you ladies to speak about that. Natalie, what are your thoughts coming from, you know, the beef side where there's a lot of criticism, you know, around what the implications are for the environment? Yeah. I don't even know where to dive in. Cause there's so many touch points of things we could talk about. Um, but there are a lot of misconceptions and I do think cattle have kind of become like our society's scapegoat at a point right now. Um, it's like a nice little clean package that you can feel good. Like you were making a personal, you know, attempt to save the environment, um, and do all the things by not eating meat. Like it's very clean and simple. Um, but beneath that, it is not clean and simple at all. Ruminants, which is what animals are or what cows are, are very, very important to the environment and soil health in general. Um, agriculture and livestock are actually, um, I said that wrong. Agriculture and forestry are the only two industries that can sequester carbon, that can act as carbon sinks. And so uh, I think it's really important that if we do want to make a change, you know, as a society moving forward with, you know, quote unquote, climate changes or climate problems, what, you know, whatever you call that, uh, you have to to understand that our soil health um, is what's going to be doing that. And ruminants out at pasture are a key part of that. There's actually five principles to soil health and a grazing animal is one of them. So I'm really proud to be a rancher, despite what some of those narratives are saying, because um, I know that my animals are you know, doing good for the soil. I know we're care taking care of them so that they take care of the land. Um, I'm not sure what, is there certain touch points you want to dive into below that or... Yeah. Well, you know, I, like you said, there are so many different ways to slice and dice this and so many different arguments and cases that are tried to, or, or that are pushed on people to advocate that there's less waste associated with a plant dominant 
diet. So, you know, we're there, there's obviously the ethical side for some people. And then there's, there's the people that say, Hey, you know, we can replace everything that you get as far as nutrition from animals with plants. And we can spare the environment. Like the, the soil, the land is going to be much cleaner and greener and, uh, and, and be able to proliferate more without, you know, using cattle on these lands. So maybe even talk about the soil. You mentioned that, um, even just like, maybe it was Tara. I think I saw something that you posted about like cow poop or something. And you were like, <laughs> people do not realize that this part, this side of it, this waste that people, you know, think is just something we have to dispose of actually has tremendous value when it comes to the land and actually keeping the land very diverse and rich in terms of the nutrients that are offered from it. Yeah. So I'll talk a little bit on the flip side of the coin. Natalie talked about grazing cattle and the benefits of them. Well, we, our cows are actually in confinement. They're in a pen, like a large open, it's called an open lot pen. Um, and so what we do is we actually collect all the manure from those pens and compost it. And then that manure goes out to other local farms in our area. Like it goes beyond our farm out to others. And one of the best ways to improve soil health is to add manure. It increases the organic matter, which is like the heart and soul of soil is having a really healthy organic matter and uh, cow manure is optimal for that. And both Natalie and I are actually in pretty sandy soils. And so by increasing the organic matter, you're improving so much of soil health, the healthier soil is the more carbon it will actually sequester. So it's just, there's so many integral details of like soil health and how cattle play into that, that it's not, um, it's not a simple conversation. It's a very like gets down on the very detailed level of the soil profile and the benefits there. Um, Another really great thing that both Natalie and and I like to talk about is on the dairy cow side, a lot of what our cattle eat are actually byproducts. So it is things that um, leftovers from things that humans do. So maybe grocery store waste or bakery waste, brewery waste, like the grains that are distilled from brewery. Um, all the way up to even like bigger things like um, the production of ethanol has a lot of byproducts that our cattle are able to consume. And it has very, very good uh, environmental benefits. So if you were to take all of those byproducts and not feed them to cattle and they were to end up in a landfill, it would increase the uh, emissions by 49 times. So instead, our cattle are able to consume them and turn them into nutritious meat and, and dairy. And it's Everything you can think of from if you're making orange juice, there's pulp left over. There is the peel of the orange. All of that kind of stuff are things that cattle can eat that would otherwise just go to waste. And so they're really from the soil to like all different facets of our food production system. They're really integral part of that. What is it? Is this now something that you do specifically or is this something that you would say across the board that dairy or beef cow beef ranches are utilizing? So Natalie and I both, and Natalie can speak on the beef side. I feel like we both have very like pretty traditional operations like that are similar to other operations like ours. So for, you know, feeding byproducts, that is something that dairy farms across the country do. I always joke that cattle are very local eaters. So what a cow in Florida, like is going to be eating like citrus peels. That is not what our cows in New Mexico are going to be eating because that's not what's available to us. Our cows are going to be eating um, actually cotton seed, which is a byproduct from making cotton. And so California dairy farmers will feed their cattle uh, almond holes. So it's just very specific, but across the board, this is things that lots of cattle operations, dairy farms are implementing. And it's just unique to what their area looks like, what their region has to offer. That's so interesting. Yeah, I don't want to sound like PRE <laughs> or like what a typical farmer and rancher would say, but you know, we're not a very good farmer and rancher if we're not looking for innovative ways to progress um, our operation and sustainable ways to progress our operation. You know, you don't um ranching and farming is very capital intensive. And so you don't uh, start a ranch usually typically with the idea to sell it. I mean, some obviously there's a small portion of people that are doing like investments and land, you know, but they're they're not the average rep- representation of like a U.S. you know farmer and rancher, right? Um, so our goal as ranchers and farmers is to sustain to the next generation. You know, typically you want your kids to come back to the operation and to maintain what you did. And if you think about what that entails, I mean, you're not picking up a ranch and typically moving it, so you have to be in the same spot you know, the same fields, the same pastures, 
for years, you know, some of these operations are, I mean, Tara's fifth generation, you know, the people are sixth and seventh. That means they have been 100, 200 years in the exact same spot. Um, and in order to think of it, you know, whether it's an emotional part that you're giving on to your children or literally a business that you're passing on, if you are not taking care of the land, like you, we do not have a job that it technically is our job is to take care of our land and our animal. And so when you ask if, you know, are all farms and ranches doing this, I can't say we're all doing it the exact same way, but definitely at the forefront of every single mind is like, okay, how can I best take care of this land so that it is here continually for the next generation and the generation after that and so on and so forth. Yeah, that makes total sense. Are a lot of farms, this may be like a really like remedial question, but I'm thinking, you know, the mass scale farms, like kind of like the ones that have scaled their industrial, um, more industrial in nature, like factory type farming, are they owned by like the, some of these mega corporations is the land and the operation itself owned. Like I'm thinking like the PET or whatever brand for milk, like what is their operation looking like? Because I feel like they're probably not, you know, they probably employ a lot of people, but they're not actually, and maybe I'm wrong, but they're not partnering with individual smaller farms. They they're purchasing large amounts of land and doing these operations on their own. Is that, is that right? That is such a great question, Natalie, and I love talking about factory farming. Um, there is a lot of misconceptions around the size of operations. And so big does not always mean bad, like small does not mean better. Size does not necessarily like influence what a farm is or who it's owned by. So by, I would say by activist quote unquote standards, the dairy farm I live on, it would be a factory farm. We milk about 2000 cows, which is pretty much average for New Mexico, which is kind of unique. Other states do not have as big of farms. It's just uh, Eastern New Mexico, West Texas are are known for larger herd sizes because of our geography and our climate. Um, but that being said, my you know backyard is our close-up cow pen. So our cows are right behind us. We're about 100 steps from the dairy barn. Uh, I mean, we are actively living and being on this farm. And so actually, I think it's uh, about 98% of all dairy farms in the United States are family owned and operated. And so the way it works actually for dairy is, you know, like a larger brand will have the processing facilities, but it will bring in milk from dairy farms all around. So if you have like a big brand, um, like even Fairlife, for example, so Fairlife was actually founded by the co-op I'm a part of, and it was founded by 99 dairy farm families. And then lots of dairy farms supply milk to Fairlife. Like it's not like Fairlife owns a dairy farm and then only Fairlife milk comes from there. It comes from family farms, just like ours that provide for it. And a really cool fact about dairy is if you buy the conventional milk on the shelf at your grocery store, it typically comes from a dairy farm less than 100 miles away from that grocery store. So it is a very local product that um, it leaves my farm and is at the grocery store in less than 48 hours. So it's just a super cool process. So even though there are bigger dairies, it is very family owned, like a very local system. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I, that's something that I've been kind of curious about because there's also in the space of natural health, like a lot of people will say like, Hey, support the small local farmers. And like, it's kind of like finding a needle in a haystack because people are like, that's cool. But where are these people? <laughs> like, how do I find them? Do I need to just drive out to like the remote country areas around where I live? And just, you know, so I think a lot of us want to be able to support and vote with our dollar, but sometimes it's just hard knowing. And unless you're, unless you're a company that's got a lot of money that you can put towards marketing, you're probably not going to be able to tap into, you know, some of your local market because people just don't know where to find you. So it's, to me, it's always interesting trying to navigate because we are consuming these products. We, we, you know, the major vast majority of us are not farmers. We are completely disconnected with farming practices. We don't really understand. We know we need to buy this stuff to live, but we don't really know one, what we're getting for our money, what, what labeling, what the labeling actually means for our health. We've kind of you know, there's a lot of marketing that can really, it's not real, you know, it's, it's, it's selling you something that might not exactly have the level of integrity that you think. So I think that we've talked about that in other episodes. So when it comes to what you do, like, what is it specifically that you really want people to take home or understand 
that maybe will change their perspective about agriculture in general, because I think many of us do not, we are so out of touch with farming because that left our families like generations ago. So we just, we don't even have a vantage point that can really bring in perspective that allows us to understand what agriculture is like in this day and age. So I share quite a bit on my personal Instagram page. Um, and quite often I will get comments or DMS that say, you know, how do we support a family like you? Or if I knew that every ranch across the U S was like your families, I would feel so much more comfortable buying beef. And this is always like a hard position for me to be in because, um, I, you know, we're a fairly larger operation and kind of to the same tune Tara was just talking about, you know, the average beef herd size is only 43, you know, our operation is well into the hundred. So by any standpoint, you know, we're, we're much larger than anyone else. Um, so our beef just enters the conventional supply chain on the same note. It is just my husband and I, and one employee, two employees. Now we just hired someone, um, and occasionally like an intern. So very small, again, you know, a family is behind this. Um, our, like I said, my beef just goes to the grocery store. So I am kind of on this, it's not a soapbox, but it is what you asked what I want people to know when they're listening to us. I think as a society, we are kind of starting to meld food safety and food nutrition together. Like we're blurring the lines of what is truly like what safety really means and what nutritious really means. And we're kind of inner, like inner changing them almost. I want people to know that when you go to the grocery store, you truly are getting a safe product. You know, we can dive into antibiotics. We can dive into welfare. We can dive into all the, you know, labeling. That's a huge thing. We talk into our podcast all this time, how confusing they are, what it means. Um, but at the end of the day, you are getting a safe product truly like as Americans, we have a very safe, affordable, abundant food system. Like that is what our food system is actually built on. Then you can get into the nutrition component of it. Right. So that is kind of where I dice like can digress into to different conversations of should you buy local support your small farmer you know when it comes to other things you're looking for but if you are just listening and you want to feel safe walking into the grocery store i can assure you my ranch is no different than every other cow calf operation across the us that is what is entering the grocery store beef you are getting a product that was owned by a family was raised with intention and it is safe for you to consume yeah that's a great point do you think that there's any there are certain areas I've seen this um, recently where they have done maps of different exposures of something like glyphosate, something that's been more prevalent. It's been obviously used quite a bit in the last you know decade or so. Um, and so this this glyphosate, which is Roundup. So if you're listening and you're like, "What is this?" It's basically a weed killer, but it is a known carcinogen, um, and it's used. It's everywhere. I mean, it's in our groundwater. I mean, they've tested it everywhere. So would you say that there, I would, I would then pose the argument of, are there certain areas where, you know, these cows are getting exposures to things where their meat would be affected. So certain areas or, you know, parts of the country may have a different level of toxicity or chemical burden than others, given, you know, what it is that's being farmed around these ranches, because obviously there, there's a lot farming, you know, there's, there are highly like dense agricultural areas in certain parts of the country. And they're not all farming, you know, livestock. They may be doing corn or something like that, where there's a heavy load of chemicals um, and all that runoff. I mean, it all ends up somewhere, you know, whether the cows are drinking it or, you know, it's just overspray, things like that. Is that something that has come up or something that has been looked into? Are there studies on that to show that cows in different parts of the, of the country are affected by these things? So there is lots and lots of studies out there about Roundup for the simple word um, and weed killer in general, her herbicides, pesticides, all of these things. And both Natalie and I are not heavy on the farm side. Like we both are more on the cattle side. Um, but I will say if there's one thing I think about all of this conversation around kind of, you know, like the fear of these things is the more removed you are from agriculture, I think the more that you fear it and the more that you have questions about it and are unsure about things. As a person who knows lots of farmers who use Roundup, it is not something I personally worry about on a day-to-day -day basis. 
I know how much they're spraying, how little actually is, is that they're spraying, how much it's mixed with water. Um, as an environmental consultant, I've spent a lot of my time sampling groundwater for farmers and dairy farmers in lots of regions. And I think just having that firsthand knowledge and experience, it it's just not something that weighs really heavy on me. And I think that has to do with being more connected to it when you see it, when you're a part of it and you see the application and you're talking with the farmers, it just changes the conversation and um, kind of like the dynamic uh, of where that fear kind of comes from. Yeah, that's a, it is, it is, uh, we live in a world where we make a lot of choices because of fear and that then people, all they need to know are one or two things about a subject matter to be able to make a, a, a decision on whether or not they feel like it's, it's kind of living in at the world of absolutes. And like you said, it can't be nuanced at all. It's like, it's like, if we tag this one thing is bad, it's all bad. And you just have to stay away from it or it's going to kill you. And so I think that can be one thing that if you're really health conscious, it can be a rabbit hole that you just go down and everything can be poison and everything can be bad for you. And, and you just have to tease it out a little bit because, you know, otherwise you'll, you will, you know, you'll drive yourself crazy and your health will suffer. Your mental health will suffer, which will then impair your physiology. And we know that. So, um, that's a really good point to make. I'm thinking of something else too. And this is, (laughs) I'm really going rogue on this conversation now because I, you know, I'm not sure. And this may be something that you've talked about, but it is, it is something that I've seen recently. And that is in the discussion regarding the MRNA vaccine for livestock. So is this something one, and I, you're going to, you know, I do not know. I will not even pretend to claim that I know what the legislation is around it, but I have seen some different published studies and articles that have said, you know, okay, this is approved for livestock. Now it's going to be used. And then people will message me and say, oh my gosh, I'm not going to buy me now because all the cows are getting, you know, vaccinated from the MRNA vaccine, you know? So what, what, what are the standards right now for that specifically? I have a lot of thoughts on this. Um, So we actually did a podcast episode on this. I just looked it up. It is episode 85 for anyone who wants to deep dive this conversation. We brought on a vet and we talk about antibiotics and vaccines, specifically the mRNA. So speaking from the livestock industry, currently there is no mRNA that is proved. It is not being used on cattle. Um, I have not personally as a rancher, been aware of anything that's even remotely close to coming down the pipeline for us to use. You know, I first asked my husband about it and he had no idea. So I I really do not think it is anywhere near being used in livestock. Um, But that is not to say it will never be developed and potentially for use with livestock. I believe it is currently used in chicken and pigs, which I think is where some of the conversation about, no, no, it is being used. Like there, it it is in the meat or whatever. It's because, um, For some reason, animal proteins always get lumped together, like pig, chicken, and beef are together, even though they're, it's vastly different of how we raise chicken versus pigs versus beef. Um, They're just always lumped together, which is like what actually one of my soapboxes. Um, So no, they're, the mRNA is not being used. You know, the vet goes into description and talking on our podcast episode about how you know, the fear is that it, you know, the MRA, if it is in the beef or the animal that consumed it would be in the beef and then it would be in, you know, the human body and it would have replications on, you know, our DNA. Um, I think, you know, he says right now there are, there's no studies out there to prove that, support that, show that in the science. Um, But again, I I understand when you are removed from your food system, why you have those questions, why you have the fear. Okay. Yeah. I was just curious because I'm not, I'm not well-versed on, on the agriculture side with, you know, specific livestock for vaccines. And a lot of people are really just using their own frame of reference, which is just what we do for human protocols. And we start to see, you know, Hey, the CDC has changed and they've added and added and added and added. And I'm like, you know, I think that that's really, this is where there's such a miss, right? Because, and, and this is what your platform really serves or, or lends, um, a, a perspective to is that, 
the only really frame of reference we have is the stuff that we have control over that we're making decisions on. And that's usually just for ourselves because we're not buying these animals. We're not having to care for them. We're not seeing the diseases that can manifest in, in different herds and populations. And we don't know the different struggles. So we're like, okay, well, do they need that? Is that going to affect me? And, and honestly, the only power we have is the purchasing power. So we either decide we're going to consume it, we're going to support it, or we're not, we're not participating in it. And a lot of people will make those decisions based out of fear and say, I don't know. I don't feel like I can make an educated decision because I am so far removed from it. And so I'm just going to maybe go with a different option. I'm going to eat the bean burgers for the rest of my life. (laughs) And, you know, I feel safe with that. Yeah. The other thing I'll add to this is that because you talked about the only frame of reference we really have, right, for a consumer who is removed from it is like how it how you think of vaccines in your your own life. Um, And I When it comes to, I guess, human vaccination, we have built up a lot of herd immunity to the things we're vaccinating for, right? So that's why people are like, do I really have to give my children an MMR vaccine? Like, when's the last time I saw rubella running around? You know, like, what about polio? Like, do we really need to be giving these things that we have, you know, eradicated essentially through vaccination use? Like, we're very lucky as humans to be at a point where we can say, no, you know, I'm going to deny that vaccine for myself or my child. Um, and still probably, you know, I don't have the percentages, but, you know, odds are you're not getting exposed to polio walking down the street, right? The things that we are vaccinating for in our animals are not things that are like, it's not the same thing. You know, we're not vaccinating for something that like cattle got in the early 1800s, you know, and we're still trying to like minimize herd immunity by by maintaining vaccination protocol. It's like very active viruses that are, that cattle are exposed to, a, you know, um, able to catch that immediately then. And so that's why I think there's that big distinction between like, oh, I'm going to make that choice of like no vaccinations in my family versus like we as the ranchers and farmers don't really have that choice. Like, oh, I'm going to choose not to vaccinate my herd um, and take the risk that we're not going to get anything because odds are like it would probably be devastating to your herd. Yeah, I will jump in here to something that you said about how if you aren't even sure you're going to maybe just pick something different altogether. Natalie has a really great story about being in the grocery store. Both Natalie and I get our beef directly from our own herds. Like I get, you know, we harvest a cow. Natalie does the same and we're not big chicken households, (laughs) but Natalie went to the grocery store and was in the chicken aisle buying something. And there were so many labels, so many marketing tactics on all the packaging that she left being like, I don't even know if I want to buy chicken. Like what is even happening? And that's as a person who we know, like we know what's going on. We know what the labels should mean, but we didn't even like, so it's, I think it's a very like normal feeling to be like, I don't understand what all of these labels mean, what all these marketing tactics are. And it can be really overwhelming. And that is one thing that you know, labels, it's like, we can't live with them and we can't look, live without them. Like people want to see certain labels, right? They want to see antibiotic free, even if every single chicken on the shelf is antibiotic free. They want to see whatever it is, even if it doesn't necessarily like mean what they think it means. Like I'll even use um, in dairy, you will see RBST free on all of the milk jugs. There is not milk on the shelf from cows treated with RBST. And yet every single milk jug has that label. But if it didn't have that label, it would put like other questions into people's minds. And so it's just really tough to be able, you know, as a consumer to go in and know what they all mean. And I don't know that there's a right or like what the right answer is here, but it it does make for very difficult and a lot of fear based like shopping, buying decisions, you know, purchasing power. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, it's it's just an interesting time to be raising a family and be understanding really what our conventional Western healthcare system looks like seeing some major holes, understanding that big pharma is out there pumping drugs for everything. And there's a lot of, it's all, it's all about profitability, you know, for the most part. And it's very little about our health. It's like 0% about really sustainability for, or longevity for our own health. And so as people become more aware of this and start advocating for themselves, they basically assume, Hey, everybody has an agenda. Everybody's looking for the almighty dollar. You've got to prove to me that you're trustworthy and I can actually support you and be using your products and things like that. That's kind of the mindset that a lot of people are starting to fall into. And so I think that it does create a a huge gap between, you know, what it is that we need for sustainability, you know, right. We're, 
we're not farming it ourselves. So we've got to get it somewhere, but also this lack of understanding and education and finding and really thinking that if it is a farm that I'm not aware of, or that isn't super transparent, they're not marketing to me all of the different things I need to see, then in my mind, this isn't something that I can feel safe or feel good about as far as, you know, feeding my family, putting meals on the table. So, and, you know, what would you say, too, about like some of these documentaries that are going around, there's been several, like there's Forks Over Knives. I think you guys actually just posted um, about one of them. Uh, I think it was Game Changers. And so you'll see, like, we, I think we talked earlier about this, but just kind of this Hollywood perspective of, you know, what, what farming is doing to your body and to the earth. And, you know, it's just devastating everything. And so, you know, they're, they're obviously not these are not people that are working, putting their hands, you know, to the plow here. These are, these are filmmakers and producers that, you know, obviously have some kind of agenda, but again, they're spreading a message. So what would you even say about some of these documentaries that maybe people need to be asking themselves some questions about so that they can have a better lens to interpret the message? So we're actually debunking a bunch of, it's a summer series we're doing where we're debunking, um, common popular food documentaries and really getting into the weeds of them. We, our first one was game changers, like you mentioned, and we brought on a registered dietitian, you know, game changers did not have an RD as an expert opinion throughout the entire film. And she had some very interesting things to say, um, with her medical, you know, professional experience about, you know, what they were saying, how they were positioning things, different takes they were doing stuff they were cherry picking. Um, it's very relevant stuff and a lot of dangerous stuff too. And I can't, stop thinking about Courtney, how you said that, um, I feel like at the very last thing we as a society are, are, um, putting first, essentially we're putting it last is our health sustainability, right? Like everyone is really focused on environmental sustainability. Everyone's really focused on like economic sustainability. Um, and I feel like there is very little focus, just like you said on health. And it put me in the position of a consumer walking to the grocery store. And like, we've just been talking about having all these questions and fear about, you know, um, how the chicken was raised, you know, what the, whether MRNA is in the beef or what antibiotic is in the beef. And so instead of shopping there, they're actually going down, you know, the middle of the grocery store and they're like, well, I'll buy the packaged granola bar that says organic on it. Um, and they make that choice instead. And that is where I just like really crumble on the inside because that is at the root of the problem of our health, right? You know, just because it has some of those labels on it, does not make it healthy. And yet we're choosing them because of fear of the, the most nutrient dense items in the grocery store. And so I do think there needs to be, you know, I don't know where it comes from labeling USDA farmers and ranchers, consumers asking questions like where the, the answer is, but I do think we have a big problem in our food system when it comes to setting people up to make the right choices for themselves nutritionally. Ah, oh, I love that you just said that because that is a, that's really, it's becoming so just wildly more popular is where people will say like, okay, I just don't really know. I don't know. We see this with organ meats and we've done several episodes on organ meats and how, you know, eating nose to tail can benefit you in so many ways, but it, culturally, that's just not something that is very accessible to us because one, you're not going to the grocery store buying bison tongue and, you know, heart and liver and all of these things, like some places you can find it, but it's just, it's, it's not like front and center for you. And even if you, if it was there, most people would be kind of be grossed out and they're like, Oh, I don't know what to do with it. My, my kids aren't going to eat it. I'm not going to spend money on it, but we do opt for convenience. We opt for something that we feel like we, we have control or we have some type, some level of understanding. So if it says, okay, well it's packaged, it's, you know, it could sit on a shelf for five years and still be fine to eat, but you know, it says that it's organic and, you know, it was cold pressed and all these different labels that sound like it's going to be really, really nutrient dense for you. When ultimately, if you were just eating something that was a single ingredient animal product, like it would go so much further for you nutritionally, like, and, and honestly, you know, outside of just supporting, you know, the, the, the farms that are really creating sustainability on so many different levels, like you're actually meeting the needs of your body. So, which on a very personal level should be very important to us. So I love that you brought that up because it, there is a huge shift in that. And I think even like in the frozen food section, you'll see a lot of things that are vegan or made from different plant products that are packaged in all of these, like very easy, like there's no prep, you know, you can microwave it, you could thaw it out, you can throw it in a blender, whatever it is like, those are great. But again, we're getting so far away 
from nature, what nature intended, like the, the grassroots of what we should be eating, they would probably eliminate a lot of our disease. And, and so in doing that, we're kind of replacing one thing that we think is maybe detrimental or we don't under fully understand. And then we're just replacing it with something that has even more implications of negative health outcomes. So I really love that you brought that up. Yeah. I think a lot about, um, right now we're entering into like 3d pressed meat and salmon and fish. Like I just saw Ashton Kutcher is the backer behind, um, you know, lab grown salmon or fish, I guess. And you said, you know, we're getting so far away from how we're intended to eat. And I, I cannot stop thinking about those as examples. Like we're so focused on the environmental components of what maybe a cow house at a pasture, which we don't even, you know, we've already talked about we don't even have the correct understanding of that. Right. So that's built off of falsity. Um, but we're so focused on fixing that, like lowering our methane reductions, let's say that we're willing to instead eat this 3d lab printed meat. Like what's that doing to our body, you know? And I just, it blows my mind that that's the point we're at in society where we're willing to make those decisions and sacrifices. Um, and a lot of them are based off not even true facts. You know, it's like, we're, it's so turned up right now. It's turned upside down. I, I really, I hope that, Ashton's going to just pop out and like, tell us we're all punked or something <laughs> <laughs> like, just kidding guys. I'm not behind this. Wouldn't that That's be nice? wild. That's so crazy. I did a, a mini episode on lab grown meat not too long ago. Uh, I'll link it here with some of the other podcasts that we've talked about. I was blown away when I was reading about it and the stem cell selections. And I mean, they're putting these things in like test tubes and culture, culturing them to just populate different types of meat. And we're creating a food group that has never existed before. And then we're now just fabricating whatever regulations we want. Cause this is, in, this isn't, this is new. This is, you know, how do you regulate something that literally did not exist before? It's like, it just blows my mind. But, um, yeah. 3d printed meat. I mean, that doesn't, that sound appetizing. <laughs> we recently covered lab grown meat on the podcast talking about there's new research coming out that, um, it's carbon footprint is about 25 times higher than conventional beef. And both Natalie and I were like, well, duh, like what, on um, what planet did you think that growing a food in a test tube inside of a climate controlled building factory was going to be better than like cattle grazing out on pasture? Like just how, you know, we were talking about how do we get so wrong that we like fear a single ingredient food like beef, but we don't fear the packaged food that has 25 ingredients that we're not even sure what they are. But like, we think that maybe lab grown beef, beef would be healthier, more like, it's just like, uh, yeah, it, it is an episode of punk. I'm hoping that maybe we all wake up from. <laughs> <laughs> I'm with you on that. I mean, this is, I, it's, it really is. Uh, it's just an interesting time that we're living in. And I do think that one positive is that there's a lot of awareness and there's conversation that's beginning to happen. And so people are curious and they want to know instead of just taking it as Bible, like, oh, this is truth. This is, you know, some corporation made it. It must be okay. People are very skeptical now. Um, and I think that, you know, we're in this post COVID era where now we see a lot of these organizations that have been trusted for decades, you know, that, that we feel like have had our best interest at heart have very much let people down, um, disappointed them on, on levels that are, you know, you, you can't recover from, um, because they've been bold faced lied to and people have lost family members and, and just so many different things that are, have just been devastating. So, um, you know, on, on the one side, I do love that people now will, they, they are actively seeking information from people that they trust. And that's really what we aim to do. And, and that's why we love having these conversations because it just spreads the awareness so that people People can feel educated. They feel empowered to make decisions and they don't feel like they're being marketed and sold something that is only profiting or benefiting another person or organization. So, uh, so ladies, this has been a fun conversation. Yes. Thank you for having this on. I love that you ended on that note. Cause that's exactly how we feel about like discover ag is we believe in food choice ultimately, like make the decision that works for you and your body. But if we can give you some information, um, give you some practical, tactical advice on what's actually happening on the ground, boots on the farms, boots on the ranches um, about the food system and what's going on, um, then hopefully you can make a better decision on your food um, based on your needs. Yeah. 
Totally. Okay. So Natalie, tell us about you, both of your, your podcast that you do together, discover ag, but, and then individually your social channels where people can find you guys, their social media is awesome. They post so many reels and you actually just did one on methane. It's really, I mean, it's very informative. So not only is it, is it entertaining and fun to see what you're doing behind the scenes, but I appreciate all of the effort that you put towards educating people on the things that you're learning and the things that you've experienced. So give us the rundown of where people can connect. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Thank you. Um, since you're all listening to this in podcast form, I'm guessing you are podcast people. So you can hop over and follow our podcast, discover ag. And we've already you know mentioned multiple times, kind of what we do there, but it's a Thursday podcast. And we basically take the top trending topics, headlines, things that are going on in the news in the food and ag space. Um, and we break them down, giving our personal opinion. And we really get into the weeds of things. We try and, you know, cover both sides, pose questions, answer questions. Um, so it's usually pretty um, informative, but it's also pretty fun. And then you can follow us both on Instagram. So I'm at Natalie Kavoric, which is just my name. And then same for Tara. She's just at her name at Tara Vander Dusen. Awesome. Awesome. Well, guys, I am so glad that we've been able to have this conversation together. Ladies, I know I said that I just wanted to be your friend in the beginning. Now <laughs> I definitely want to come out <laughs> and visit. So when I actually get a farm up and going, which hopefully will be sooner than later, I need to learn all the things from you. So I'll have to pop on out to the Midwest and, and make a trip. I'll make the tour. So <laughs> you are Thank welcome you. anytime. Yay. I, I know our door well, is always open. Okay. In the meantime, I'll follow along all the social, the pictures of where you guys live are absolutely gorgeous, beautiful, beautiful. So, uh, definitely want to try and swing over, but guys, thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed this conversation. Make sure you like share it, leave us a review, send us a DM, connect with these ladies. We love hearing from you. I hope this supported you and that you have a great day. We'll see you on the next episode. Mm -hmm.